all for coming. Uh, my name is Victoria Sampson. I'm the last <coughs> staff director for the Secure World Foundation. The Secure World Foundation is a private operating foundation that focuses on the sustainable use of space. Um, we look at how basically space can better life on this earth. And so our interest in this topic is um, whether or not the access to space will be interrupted if spectrum is auctioned off. So we'd be very curious to hear um, our very big, very um, expert panel of uh, opinions on these issues. And um, with that, just because of timing, we're gonna, I'm going to go on to our speakers. Uh, you should have the bios in front of you. I would like to add this event is being recorded and um, it's on the record, so FYI, do yourself one. Um, well, we're basically just going to go down the line, have all of our speakers give their additional remarks, then there'll be time for Q&A afterwards. Yeah, uh, next one. First of all, Karen Clayson. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you for, for hosting us. Um, <coughs> the AMS representative who's co-sponsoring this event. I'm grateful to be here with you today. The data from satellite measurements make a very significant contribution to many of other products that are used by government, companies, and individuals. These weather products include not only general forecasts, the more immediate and urgent watches, warnings, and advisories. Whether we are talking about numerical weather prediction model outputs, space weather events, weather information for emergency managers, the relay of hydrometeorological data from geographically remote land, sea, or stream sensors, or images seen on the evening television weather broadcast or on internet websites, all utilize the radius spectrum to bring operational science data from space to the Earth. Many federal, state, local, and tribal and private sector users depend upon the direct broadcast of data from geostationary weather satellites. However, we don't know exactly how many direct broadcast users exist because receive-only satellite ground stations may be purchased by anyone without a license and generally for most users without the protection from radio frequency interference that a license generally suggests. Uses for this broadcast may include for example, a primary method of severe weather warning, especially after the ground power or communications infrastructure has been impacted by the weather event, or the redundant communications path needed to create time-sensitive operational federal or private sector products. As an example of users <coughs> of a direct broadcast, Alaska and Hawaii need satellite data due to the shortage of surface weather stations. The data collection system users receive data in this band for hydrologic forecasting and flood warning. Space weather data from GOES is received exclusively in this spectrum. These are three of many examples. Many people are using products that were created by using the direct broadcast in either a primary or a backup mode, and this group of users are very likely unaware that these products depend upon being able to receive the satellite data. We will hear about these and other examples of products that many people across the country use every day, as well as other affected products that at some time someone may need to receive warnings of imminent danger. Why is the spectrum, and thus the ability to receive data in these wavelengths, in danger of interference in the first place? Put simply, the commercial use of smartphones and tablets have skyrocketed. Movie downloads and streaming of large amounts of data have become ubiquitous in today's world. To meet the demands for ever more spectrum-intense uses, such faster and greater streaming of data, or simply more wireless features, the commercial broadband industry requires more and more segments of the radio spectrum. Spectrum is a finite resource, and most of that spectrum is already occupied by multiple users. From November 13th of last year to January 30th, the U.S. Federal Commun Communications Commission conducted a spectrum auction to share two bands nationally with commercial broadband wireless users. To understand some of the market forces at work, we note that a small orphan segment of spectrum, currently used for downloading the post satellite data and direct broadcast of such properties as FY3, MedOp, and Sural, brought over $2.4 billion, while a more desirable pair of DOD spectrum fielded over $42 billion during the same event. It is too late to impact that auction, but we mention it here so that the community is aware of the apparent market value of these spectrum. The sale of the spectrum thus provided an immediate and large source of revenue to the government, and so future spectrum sales are ever more likely. Demand is such that more bands are under consideration for a future auction. These new candidate bands include the GOES GOESAR broadcast downlink band, used to send all level 1B imagery and level 2 data, relay of data collection systems from terrestrial sensors, 
space weather downwinds from those and those are, the low rate information transfer and the emergency manager's weather information network said Amwin, with high rate information transfer are all in this spectrum. To make that band viable for sharing with commercial users, the NWS radio songs would have to be moved to a new band. Another band under consideration for sharing are the NextRad radar spectrum. These future band candidates are likely to be selected by May or June of this year, after which a short public comment opportunity would occur prior to the final band selection for the subsequent future auction. We as a community need to raise awareness of the impacts of these actions and explore how we can best mitigate, live with, or adapt to these changes. If meteorological users believe this change to the weather infrastructure could affect them in any way, participating in those public comment opportunities are essential. Inputs from a few hundred users will likely make little difference. But significant comments from a multitude of users in different segments will be heard. Our goal today is to raise the awareness of the user community on what selling of the spectrum may mean to them, to industry, and to the general public. It is our hope that by doing so, we might be able to work together to find out how to best move forward for both our community and the larger population. The panelists today will provide some context and understanding of the scope of the issues. And we are very pleased to have them with us with today, so please give them your attention. First up, Nick Lubar. Thank you, uh, Caroline and Victoria. My name is David Lubar, and I'm the Radio Spectrum Management Specialist from the Aerospace Corporation. I support GOSAR weather satellite development programs on spectrum issues. I should add, though, that the views expressed in this presentation are my own, and I'm not speaking for NOAA or the Department of Commerce on radio frequency maps. Slide one that you see, uh, we'll give a little background. Uh, since the early 1970s, NOAA weather satellites have featured a direct broadcast capability that was available to anyone who had a ground receiving station. Those capabilities have created an evolved architecture where federally licensed satellites broadcast to a wide variety of federal and non-federal ground receiving systems in the L-band radio spectrum, specifically from 1675 to 1695 megahertz. The GOZAR broadcast architecture is a busy slide, which I'm not going to breathe. I just want to simply note the industry sectors of non-federal users, which are listed in the bottom in the orange color, which receive satellite data, and to the right, the data collection system and the emergency management weather information network users. End users benefit from data sent to federal facilities, non-federal end users directly, and the private weather enterprise. So let's just talk a little bit about them. Services on the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite, or GOES, include the following. Number one, a broadcast downlink of full resolution, calibrated, near real-time data and images from each instrument on the spacecraft observatory to federal and non-federal users known as GVAR today and GRB on the new satellite series. Second, a data relay system known as DCS, which carries about 750,000 messages per day of river, stream, and tidal gauge data and other types of environmental sensors to federal, state, local, and tribal and private users. Number three, a highly reliable broadcast of near real-time products from the National Weather Service into a one-meter size ground receiving antenna with low-cost <coughs> equipment which may be battery powered called the Emergency Managers Weather Information Network, or MWIM. MWIM is intended for use by first responders and state, local, and private emergency managers. And lastly, number four, a broadcast of reduced subset of GOES imagery and other meteorological data for federal, state, and local and private use known as low-rate information transfer, or LRIT, today, and which will be known as high-rate information transfer on the GOES-R satellites. So what's shown in green on this slide are the federal services that I just mentioned, and it shows you where they are in the spectrum. Now, perhaps this radio spectrum data is a bit tedious for our audience. However, it will help set the stage for the balance of this panel discussion. I'd like to point out a favorite phrase that I use. If one considers the term millibars and the term megahertz, they're both three syllables in length. They begin with the letter M. Otherwise, they really don't have very much to do with each other. So many end users will not necessarily know that the data, which is used to create selected meteorological and hydrological products, passes through this radio spectrum. And end users may not know physically where such data is received directly from the satellite by an Earth station. 
Yet knowing both of these facts are important that stronger terrestrial commercial signals begin to create radio frequency interference to reception of those direct broadcast meteorological data. So contract this meteorological usage, as Carol Ann said in the intro, with the growing demand for broadband wireless radio spectrum enabling smartphones and tablets. I'm fairly confident that everybody in this room has one or more wireless devices, and that many people watching this delayed video broadcast on the internet will be viewing it on a smartphone, a tablet, or an internet-connected wireless device. As consumers move towards services that require additional bandwidth, it is clear that more spectrum will be required to serve that usage. So because of this demand, the administration tasked the federal spectrum regulator in 2010 to identify 500 megahertz of federal radio spectrum, which could be shared or repurposed for use by the commercial broadband wireless industry within a stated time frame. Ideally, the spectrum that is currently used primarily for federal agencies would be newly made available for non-federal applications, if and when viable alternatives can be found for the federal services. So bear with me for a bit of spectrum specifics before we address how users benefit from the data shown in the spectrum. So today, the slide shows the bands used by the current GO satellites. You see it above the line on this page in the 2016 to 2030 time frame, or actually beyond that in the 2030 time frame, for sil- what you'll see is the GOES-R application, the new generation of weather satellites that launches in one year from now. And while we have both sets of satellites in operation, you're going to see both of those services in that band. Now, you'll notice the red panels on this slide indicate current commercial use. This particular piece of spectrum directly below the GOES-R spacecraft is being leased today by LightSquared LLC for tower to smartphone broadband communications. And the band right next to it is under a legislative proposal in the President's fiscal 15 budget to make that 5 megahertz also available for broadband use. Now, as I said, you see below it in yellow the radio songs for the National <coughs> Weather Service. The plan is that, and the plan presumes, that those radio songs will be moved elsewhere in the spectrum. But this band still overlaps the hydrological and other data related to space via the BCS system that we talked about. And as was mentioned in the intro, this is the band that was just sold at auction. Okay? So the Federal Communications recently completed this auction, and uh, the 15 megahertz of current, former, current generation polar weather satellite data throughout the U.S. in possession sold for approximately $2.4 billion another block of formal federal spectrum that has nothing to do with meteorological satellite operations was sold for about $42 billion at the same auction. The 1695 to 1710 band is shared under U.S. regulations, and my presentation does not take issue with that fact. Sharing spectrum is one way to help support the significant commercial demand for wireless services. However, the balance of the GOES-R and GOES broadcast band, 1675 to 1695 megahertz, is currently under evaluation as a potential candidate for a future broadband auction. These completed auctions and the ones currently in planning have not yet fulfilled the administration's goal of finding 500 megahertz of radio frequency bandwidth for use by smartphones and tablets. Therefore, further assessments are ongoing to pick the next band or bands at frequencies currently in use by the federal government to be sold at a future auction. Studies are underway that should result in a decision on which frequencies to recommend for the next auction by May or June of this calendar year. One of the facts this panel hopes to demonstrate today is that 1675 to 1695 MHz radio spectrum is already shared with non-federal users. By virtue of the evolved infrastructure where NOAA provides space-based federal transmitters and the ground users include significant non-federal applications from state, local, tribal, and private sector entities. In addition, many segments of the U.S. economy depend upon the federal products created from data received in this spectrum to ensure their own economic success or the safety of life and property. We do not intend to dwell today on the intimate details of radio spectrum management, but there is a high likelihood that strong terrestrial signals will create undesirable interference to Earth stations receiving the weak signals coming down from the GOES weather satellites in space. Now, satellite signals are intentionally low in power output to avoid creating interference with conflicts with terrestrial communications. If stronger signals are nearby in frequency, it may be possible to reduce that interference into the Earth station with electronic filters and planned coordination zones, resulting from the current auction, for example. However, both services share the same band, the same spectrum. Filtering provides no benefit. 
desired weather data will be reduced along with the undesired broadband wireless signal. Now, if you look at the broader picture, weather has a significant impact on the United States. Recent studies led by the National Center for Atmospheric Research <coughs> finds routine weather events can create an annual economic impact of as much as $485 billion in 200, 2008 dollars. Natural disasters add to those numbers. The U.S. has sustained 178 weather events since 1980 where overall damages or costs reached or exceeded $1 billion, including CPI adjustment to 2014. The watches, warnings, and private sector products for some of these events utilize the data transmitted in the frequency bands we are discussing. I don't know how interference to direct broadcasts might alter those economic impact figures. Do you know that the direct broadcast radio spectrum is utilized by many different non-federal users, such as the private sector weather enterprise, in-house meteorological departments, water managers and hydrologists, emergency managers, and local jurisdictions to enable warning sirens for tornadoes and severe weather, and non-federal users that depend upon time-sensitive, high-availability federal products such as space weather warnings. <coughs> um, additional discussions on this topic may be found online from a panel discussion that was held on January 7, 2005 at the American Meteorological Society's 95th Annual Meeting, and the slide gives the Internet link. Thank you for letting me define the potential interference issue which can impact non-federal end-users, products, and services. Thank you, Victoria. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, we can queue up the movie here. That's... I'm Mike Johnson from the uh, National Weather Service Office of Science and Technology. And uh, um, before I, I have a few slides, but I, I got got this image this morning from uh, from our partners at the University of Wisconsin uh, Cooperative Institute for Meteorological Satellite Studies. This is a, uh, uh, let me give a little context here because it's, it, it, uh, it really drives home the point that I'm going to try to make in my uh, quick presentation. I think some of the other speakers are also going to try to make the same point. Um, and that point is, uh, is the importance of, of high reliability and low latency, uh, timely data. Uh, this is a volcano that uh, erupted two days ago in the Kanchaka uh, Peninsula. You can see the, the, the plume uh, uh, erupting. It will loop through that. Um, and I'll point out, of a larger scale here, we have uh, air traffic over the Pacific. Uh, typically follows a great arc that goes right near this area. So uh, volcanic ash is particularly uh, uh, a dangerous uh, phenomenon for, uh, for air aviation. And uh, also note, you might not be able to see, but I'll just point out, it's, uh, uh, it looks like the, uh, <coughs> the bar is, 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 uh, is, is not viewable, but I'll just point out that this is from the uh, Japanese Himawari satellite, which was launched in, uh, in October. And uh, this satellite is, the imager is a near clone of the GOES-R uh, satellite that we're going to see launched next year. Uh, and uh, so the time and the resolution on there are phenomenally, uh, 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 a phenomenal improvement over what we have right now. Uh, this time sequence is every 10 minutes, you get a scan, and this uh, particular uh, view is a visible uh, half kilometer grid uh, resolution. So it far surpasses anything that we, we have right now. Um, so that's, uh, that's I think we can go over to our, and if there's anybody that's, uh, since I just picked this up this morning, uh, this comes from uh, the Sims blog. I didn't have time to, uh, to put the, uh, the website, uh, but uh, anybody interested, I can leave that website. It's, it's a satellite blog, real-time blog that's uh, available, all sorts of uh, real interesting phenomena that comes up and that we use uh, in, in, the, in the meteorological community. Okay, so as I said, I'm, I'm uh, Mike Johnson. Oh, all right. I'm Mike Johnson and uh, Office of Science and Technology uh, at National Weather Service. 
Uh, I, my intent here is not to, I'm going to defer any sort of frequency uh, uh, type discussion to experts. Um, my my, uh, my uh, presence here, I think, is, is just to talk about uh, what the impacts are at the National Weather Service. So I show this slide because on the right hand side it says uh, uh, the primary operational concept for goes on. Uh, and that shows a, a, a downlink. Uh, to these two sites, Wallops and uh, the NOAA uh, Satellite Operations Facility. Then we have various ways of communicating uh, to our weather service offices and centers. Um, and I, on the left-hand side, the point that I'm trying to make here, but really <coughs> emphasize, is low latency. That's very important. And uh, you can see, for the example that I just showed, uh, if that's evolving on a, a scale of five to ten minutes, we need to, and that's something you're not going to predict in, in advance, you need to have as much advance warning as you can. So any interruption in that type of service would be, would be uh, a high impact. Uh, and then high reliability. You can't, uh, you need communication systems that are, are, are very uh, robust. Uh, National Weather Service is installing uh, the first, the slide I just showed, the primary op, uh, system, uh, that's that's here in uh, in the uh, in the uh, Washington D.C. metro area. Uh, but you can see we have some very critical sites that are distributed all over, uh, uh, covering areas of interest for the U.S. And uh, for that reason, if there was any sort of comms disruption in our normal paths, we built as a redundant capability. Uh, direct broadcast antennas at these sites. There's uh, seven of them. We have uh, a few uh, Himawari antennas. That's in a different band um, than, than I think we're speaking to today, but I, I, I put that for uh, completeness. And I'll, I'll talk, um, talk a little more specifically about what <coughs> each one of those sites do. Does. Uh, Alaska Region Headquarters we uh, currently have a GOES uh, direct broadcast, and we're going to install uh, a GOES R uh, direct broadcast capability, and possibly a Himawari uh, capability as well. Aviation Weather Center, that's in Kansas City, uh, we're going to have three uh, um, uh, antennas there, one looking at uh, east, one looking at west uh, satellite, and then a spare. And uh, we provide spares because of the criticality of, of uh, not losing the, the data. Um, uh, National Hurricane Center, uh, if, if you noticed in the previous slide, is in Miami. Uh, and uh, so they're obvious, uh, you know, if you happen to have a, a hurricane that disrupted uh, communications to the, uh, to the Miami area, we definitely need a, a backup capability to provide uh, communications to that site. Uh, Pacific Region Headquarters, I think... Uh, I'll, I'll lump the Pacific region and Alaska region together because they are really uh, satellite-centric warning services for the weather enterprise. There's really very few observations uh, uh, over the Pacific and up in the Arctic. Uh, so uh, satellites are, are critically important. Um, and the uh, example of volcanic ash uh, uh, example that I showed for the MMR is, is a good example. Um, Space Weather Prediction Center. Uh, uh, they're in Boulder, Colorado. The Storm Prediction Center is in Norman, Oklahoma, and uh, we're uh, developing some, uh, a, or we're installing antennas uh, here in the Maryland area at the NOAA Center for uh, uh, Weather and Climate Prediction in College Park, and uh, we have a Himawari antenna in Guam. And I'm going to try to, in the next three slides, just generally summarize what each one of these sites does that is, is uh, critically reliant on, on geostationary data collected. So the last region, I, I, uh, 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 volcanic ash, the uh, Alaska region volcanic ash center is there. And they put out warnings and advisories covering the area that they're responsible for, which includes looking at volcanoes that are, are, are along the, uh, the Russian uh, east coast. Uh, and uh, you can imagine that. <coughs> that uh, a lot of that, the, the plume activity actually uh, affects east uh, and into the Alaska area. So uh, that's 
that's a fairly active region for volcanoes. They have a large marine, fire, weather, and uh, public uh, forecast warning area. Uh, Aviation Weather Center, they're responsible for uh, warnings and forecasts for domestic and international uh, aviation. So they rely on, and they're going to increasingly rely on, the very high resolution data that's going to come from Gozar and Himawari. Uh, Hurricane Center, I've already uh, spoken to their, uh, their role, and I think most people are familiar with what the Hurricane Center does. Pacific Region, uh, uh, they cover all the uh, weather enterprise uh, elements that the uh, Weather Service uh, is responsible for, specifically marine, aviation, tropical, uh, and uh, the, the Pacific uh, uh, Hurricane Center is there, uh, and then as well as uh, public warning and vaccination. Uh, Space Weather Prediction Center, I'll say a little bit uh, more about the Space Weather Prediction Center. That's in uh, Boulder, Colorado. That's somewhat unique in that, uh, that the uh, derived products that come from, uh, from Gozar uh, are going to be produced on-site in Boulder, directly derived from the, uh, from the direct broadcast. Uh, that's different than every, every other product off of Gozar. So they're, they're more reliant on the direct broadcast signal than, than other sites. Um, and then the Storm Prediction Center, uh, and, which is in Norman, Oklahoma, uh, and they uh, look at uh, convective warning, uh, or convective watches. And, and uh, I, I think most folks are, are, are familiar with what the uh, uh, Storm Prediction Center does. <coughs> Finally, the, NOAA's, uh, the site here in College Park, uh, there are three uh, uh, centers that are primarily interested in the Ocean Prediction Center. They do marine forecasts uh, outside of the uh, coastal areas of uh, continental U.S. Uh, and the Weather Prediction Center, uh, Hydrometeorological Guidance, the Climate Prediction Center, they're less of, a, of an impact, but they're also located, uh, they're more uh, a week to and beyond forecasts. So it's not like, the uh, DB is not likely to be a, a large impact for them. And then uh, NCEP Central Operations, which includes the Environmental Modeling uh, Center, which is uh, the site for the National uh, Weather Models, uh, which is, of course, reliant on satellite data. Uh, so in summary, uh, Weather Service is installing uh, direct broadcast antennas at seven critical locations and eight if you include Guam. Uh, uh, capability is essential to high reliability and, uh, and uh, availability of the data. Uh, and the weather service missions uh, at these sites are uh, cover the, the weather enterprise missions for the life and property. That's my Thank you. Mike Steinberg. Sure, well, thank you. Uh, Thanks for having me here today. Uh, I believe I'm the only one here from America's weather and climate industry, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide some thoughts from that perspective. Uh, AccuWeather and many other companies make extensive use of weather satellite data received from a variety of sources around the world uh, via several distribution mechanisms. One second. Um, let me give you a little background. The, we use this data in the production of our suite of weather forecasts, warnings, and other content that's delivered to consumers and business. Um, the upper picture there that you see is our global headquarters and forecast center in State College, Pennsylvania. And uh, those rainbows are there every Tuesday, by the way. <laughs> uh, we also have research and operations centers in Montreal, Wichita, Edmond, Oklahoma, and a sales center at Rockefeller Center in New York City. Uh, the lower picture just shows there's a dot there for each of the data calls we serve in one day uh, as red dots. In total, we serve more than 9 billion data calls to 1.5 billion people worldwide each day. Uh, with our content available in over 100 different languages and dialects. We think that makes us the world's most viewed weather forecast provider, or at least we like to think that's the case. Um, our content's available for all digital media, 
including smartphones, tablets, wireless, mobile internet sites, digital signage, uh, through connected systems like connected cars, smart homes, connected appliances. There'll be a lot more about those as we move uh, over the next few years. Uh, through traditional media, we provide forecasts and other content to nearly 2,000 radio and television stations and newspapers, and of course to their audiences. And we provide customized services to more than 1,000 businesses and government agencies through Accurate or Enterprise Solutions. Uh, we serve with that portion of our business, 77 of the Fortune 100 companies and 54 of the Fortune Global 100 that we provide various custom services to. To do all of this, we rely upon and receive a large amount of foundational data from NOAA and National Weather Service. That includes their satellite data. Uh, we are a proud NOAA Weather Ready Nation ambassador and we directly provide actionable weather warnings to business and consumers globally. We do make all our own forecasts, but we also make available and pass on all of uh, the NOAA and National Weather Service warnings and, and other forecasts and statements. We also have agreements with dozens of national MET services all around the world, various state and local agencies, and a number of private sector data creators, all of whom supply us with important data that we use to generate the forecasts for the whole world. The issue of allocation of the radio spectrum and impacts on companies in the American weather industry is an important and interesting one. On the one hand, this one, we recognize the continued need to evaluate and optimize federal radio spectrum assignments and allocations as consumer electronics, mobile technology, and the Internet of Things experience explosive growth. Sector growth that, in fact, results in significant growth for America's weather industry as new devices and platforms arise all over the world. On the other hand, that's this one, uh, this growth cannot put in jeopardy the core delivery methods that are used by governments and America's weather industry to reliably collect, aggregate, and deliver foundational weather data because what those do is they provide mission-critical, life-saving weather products. We cannot, as a weather enterprise, unite in our common goals of saving lives and improving the quality of life for the world's citizens allow this to occur. Quite simply, these radio spectrum we're discussing are currently utilized for critical purposes that have significant value to the world in saving lives, protecting property, and growing the American economy. That, okay. We're one of the many non-federal entities that leverage multiple receive-only ground stations for the reception of real-time weather satellite data. And what we do is we actually have multiple downlinks at multiple facilities, uh, as well as direct high-speed line connected uh, to the NOAA Gateway in Stuttgart, Maryland, uh, multiple uh, NOAA port systems, uh, internet, and ver a whole variety of methodologies that we use to ensure that almost no matter what happens, we have all the data reliably and on time. Today we leverage GVAR data streams from the current those satellites, and in the future, we'll be leveraging the GRB broadcast in order to use real-time data from the GOES-R satellites. Satellite ground stations are important for the speed and reliability of the real-time data retrievals. The Internet's also an important delivery method, and while we do use that as part of our redundancy strategy, um, for the redundancy and reliability of delivery, um, users really cannot rely on one method to get their critical data. And so an additional complete data stream of imagery and sounder data is available on an equal basis to all users via broadcast. These issues are increasingly important as we move toward Gozar with the availability of huge volumes of data extremely useful for ours and others' critical operations and completely new data elements such as the global lightning mapper capability. There have been some suggestions previously of creating buffer zones around key federal sites to limit interference, but that doesn't solve the issue because there are many others uh, in America's weather industry and the academic community who reliably need this data for mission-critical operations. Well, I, I certainly don't claim to have all the answers as to how we address these issues, so I'm looking forward to our discussion today and to ongoing discussions and collaboration addressing these potential radio spectrum issues directly and collaborative, collaboratively as a community. Um, within America's weather enterprise, 
the private, public, and educational sectors have worked together successfully in a number of areas and have been increasingly partnering for the benefit of, of the economy and public safety uh, over the past decade. Uh, and I think that as we work collaboratively, we can ensure decision makers are aware of the critical uses of this information transmitted via these parts of the radio spectrum. I've listed some questions here that I think we should consider as to how we move on with this. Uh, first of all, how do we get the message out to a wide variety of potentially impacted users to help us gain their support? How do we present the message coherently and simply enough to make it resonate with other decision makers? How do we effectively educate and engage legislatures, the FCC and other decision makers, both individually and collectively as a community? How can we leverage the existing weather organizations, some of which are actively involved in educational and lobbying efforts to help with these issues? Those would include NOAA National Weather Service, Weather Ready Nation and Weather Ready Nation Ambassadors Program, American Meteorological Society, National Weather Association, uh, the American Weather and Climate Industry Association, the National Council of Industrial Meteorologists, and the Weather Coalition, among others. What are the best venues to educate and build support within the user community? National Weather Service partners meetings, NOAA satellite conferences, AMS webinars or meetings, or, or other possibilities. And finally, given the national debt, the deficit, and the current political climate, I think a new source of revenue is very tempting, and we need to keep in mind that even though the use of this data and, and its current transmission may be critical, the government might decide to spell the spectrum regardless of our view about the value it brings in its current use. So what level of backup plan do we need in place if, if that does happen? Uh, that's the end of my prepared remarks. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to, uh, to be here and to speak. Uh, this is a very important issue to us, and we want to share some of our uses of the GOES satellite, uh, DCS, and uh, how we are able to use it uh, in stream gauging. So before I, I uh, move ahead, let me just point out that you're looking at a photograph of the Mohawk River at Mohawk Falls. And that little um, shelter down the bottom left is a U.S. Just Green Gate. Oh, uh, did Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now it's falling. Now it's falling. So now you see the, the Mohawk uh, Falls, and you see the little Green Gate on the bottom. So those are the devices that we're, uh, we'll be concentrating on. Just a word about the, um, the USGS. We're not a particularly large organization. We're only about... Uh, well, much smaller than the Corps or the Weather Service or NASA, uh, about a billion dollars in our budget. Um, we're set here to um, uh, describe and understand the Earth and to share information about it. We're actually in the Earth information business. And the three things that we do a lot of, uh, we do a great deal of research, we do a little bit of assessment, um, for instance, for, for droughts or for floods, and we do a lot of monitoring. And this is the piece that I thought would be most interesting and certainly most applicable to this particular topic. So going on, this is some list of some of the uh, monitoring that we do. This is just a pull down I did one day uh, of the various kinds of parameters that we, we monitor. And those parameters include things like um, water quality, uh, salinity, uh, temperature, uh, different kinds of uh, metals, pesticides, or in water around the country. But most importantly, they also include stream flow, or discharge, as I've highlighted it here. Uh, some 8,000 gauging stations around the country monitor 24-7 stream gauging, or stream flow rather, um, and rivers ranging from the Mississippi to the smaller um, uh, tributaries. It can be as, as small as a fraction of a square mile, and up to the Baton Rouge at, uh, on Mississippi. As I said, one of the more um, important to those, at least for my business, part of, uh, of those is uh, stream flow. The stream flow is used in a variety of, um, uh, stream flow information is used in a variety of uh, decision making. Some of it is design-oriented, so how do you build a dam, how large should it be, how high should a bridge be? Folks uh, don't often appreciate that a lot of the transportation structures depend on passage over water, over rivers, and uh, figuring out how high the bridge should be is something that is, uh, requires a lot of data to, uh, to do. Uh, there's a lot of uh, needs for information on stream flow for monitoring, or rather for operating uh, water treatment or wastewater treatment plants. Those sorts of things go on 24-7. And those are things that have immediate impact. So it's very important for 
uh, our streamflow information to be available, to be uh, reliable, and to be timely. And we take great pride in doing all of those things, and we depend again on the GOES DCS to make that happen. This next slide is just a summary of uh, some of the characteristics of the stream gauging network. And you'll see here again around 8,100 8, uh, gauging stations around the country. Um, they're all real time, and they most depend on GOES satellite, and I'd say 98% of them do. And in a recent evaluation of the federal uh, networks of a variety of observation systems of a variety of kinds, uh, the stream gauging network uh, ran down pretty well. Of the 120 or so that we were looking at, uh, the stream gauging network comes in around uh, number 13. So it's fairly important to a variety of agencies and a variety of users. Um, the network runs us around $160 million a year, but here's what's really important. There's some 850 state and local agencies that help us fund that network. We actually take money from others to do this work, and they are very happy to provide it. And I've provided a little bit of the funding background down at the bottom. You see about half of the, the monies that we need for operating the network come from a state or local agency. So it's something that has an impact down at the ground level, where citizens are uh, dependent upon their local communities, their counties, their states, uh, for one service or another. The picture in the right corner is a, um, a picture of the network. In this case, I'm using a... Um, uh, the reports that have come in yesterday to illustrate uh, current water conditions, or uh, water conditions as of yesterday, relative to this time of year. If you look at there, you see the things that are in green are more or less normal. The things that are dark colors, like the, the, the blue band uh, paralleling um, the, the high valley, has, uh, is high flow. Those are um, they're very, uh, running very hot, as is the northwest. And then you see in the southwest, there's drought going on. All this from a, from an instant picture from one little place. Uh, from one, not so little place, but one part of, uh, uh, of our system where we've integrated it all. Again, it's very important to us to have uh, something that's uniform um, in terms of communications. GOES provides us that. We don't have to pipe data from one type of, of uh, radio to another and pass it through some sort of um, uh, system uh, patchwork in, in a sense. I wanted to um, just I'll show you the diagram. I won't try and explain it, but I will say that there are uh, a number of backups that are included in the, in the GOES process. We do receive data from a number of down, downlink sites, and those sites themselves are what I think are our most important, our most concerned to me. Will we be able to continue to operate them? Will they have interference? Should we share uh, the spectrum? And here are just a few uh, comments about our um, uh, our GOES usage. And in this, you'll see that the um, the GOES system is uh, fairly important to the USGS. Turns out the USGS is fairly important to the GOES system. We use a far number, we're by far the largest user of the, uh, the GOES system, GoDCS. Um, we have a number of channels reserved for our use, and we fund it uh, uh, at a fairly low level. And by that, I mean it's a fairly inexpensive system. It makes it possible for us to do stream gauging at a relatively uh, inexpensive cost. For the same amount of money that we pay in a year, we might wind up paying a subscription for somebody else for a month uh, if we had to go to around, say, a cell phone or something of that nature. So, again, it's important to us. Uh, to, to have the system. I wanted to mention just a few things that uh, sort of uh, compare and contrast the strengths and weaknesses of GOES. <coughs> and among those, as I just mentioned, the GOES is a very reliable system for us, relatively low cost. Um, there are some weaknesses that we'd like to be able to address. Uh, most important of those is that it's, uh, it's not a two-way communication stream. And we are not able to talk very much with our gauging stations, and we would like to be able to. There are a few things we might be able to do to improve our efficiency if we're able to. So again, I'm concerned, we're concerned about the impacts of sharing or, or spelling off the, the spectrum, uh, particularly in those places where we have um, downlinks, and I've tried to illustrate that in this illustration here, uh, that it might be interrupted or interfered with. So, next page. Oh, sorry, I'm not advancing up here. I'm like, trying to run two different projections. I can't see the slides. So, um, so here are a few questions to uh, parting out, well, uh, very similar to what you heard before. But um, given that GOES is a fairly weak signal, um, are we able to uh, rely on it if we have to share that spectrum? Are there ways of buffering or filtering, as we heard earlier, um, the, the GOES signals in a way that preserves their uh, continuity and, and uh, clarity uh, for us to use and, and to, uh, to pass on? And then um, given that our signals are fairly uh, low power, they have to be for us, for speed gauges, we operate most of those gauging stations off of solar panels and 12-volt batteries. So they're not connected to a, a power grid. That's very important for us not to be able to, or not to have to overtax uh, those systems with the transmitter. 
So with that, um, I guess I'll pass it on, and thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Good afternoon. I'm Jack Brown. I'm the uh, director of the Office of Emergency Management in a very small county across the uh, river from here, Arlington County. Uh, I think we're the uh, one of the most densely populated counties, but geographically one of the smallest counties in the country. Uh, we're about 26 square miles, but if you take out Reagan National Airport, the park uh, land, and the Pentagon Reservation, and Base Meyer, Henderson Hall, and uh, all the other federal footprint, we're down to about 16, 16 and a half square miles. So we're, we're pretty small, but uh, it's a great place to live, work, play, come on over, spend your tax money. You know, or spend your money so I can get tax revenue, excuse me. Uh, we, we love our visit. We have a, a lot of visitors uh, to, to the many sites in Arlington. But I'm not really here uh, representing Arlington. I'm going to talk about an Arlington specific incident, but I'm here representing my professional uh, organization, the International Association of Emergency Managers. So while I'm not an expert in GOES DCS, I'm a user, and my colleagues around the country and, in fact, around the world use platforms like this uh, every day. And we're very concerned about any impact to the capabilities you know, that, that we have. And, and certainly the commercialization of this spectrum uh, does cause us uh, some concern. Uh, but I think working with our professional organization and some of the other first responders, like the police chiefs, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, in the International Association of Fire Chiefs, and I'm a member of that organization as well. Uh, I think maybe we could uh, leverage some of some of those partnerships uh, to raise those those, those concerns. So uh, I was going to show you a little video clip, but I don't think I'm hooked up to the internet. But anyway, back on uh, June 29th, uh, 2012, throughout the day, we knew that there was going to be some pretty serious weather uh, coming through the, the national capital region here. And I'm going to say around 10 o'clock at night, I was notified by our uh, emergency management duty officer uh, that this was a pretty serious storm coming our way. And in fact, uh, he suggested with, that we uh, open our emergency operations center. I said, well, what time do you think it's, it's going to hit? He says, oh, it's going to hit in the next 15 minutes to a half hour. I said, absolutely not. I'm not going to put people in harm's way to go activate our EOC, if you will. Let's just let the storm go through. We had sent out a number of alerts to our residents and visitors uh, to let them know uh, of the impending weather. You know, stay inside, you know, seek shelter, those types of things. And if you're not signed up for your local uh, emergency alerts in your community or where you work, please do. Uh, in Arlington County, it's called Arlington Alert. It's, you can go to our website, www.arlingtonalert.com. Sign up for it. It's, it's, it's really, really simple and very valuable information. So, uh, as you can see, the uh, the derecho it's up, and I'd never heard that term until after the storm hit. Uh, that, can I stand up? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I'm, ho I'm horrible sitting and speaking. Actually, I'm horrible speaking. But... <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a mic because this is being taped. And, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm vertically challenged anyway, so I'll just kind of walk around a little bit. But you can, can we get you a mic? Oh, mic? absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you can see it covered 650 miles. This, this, this storm actually started up uh, around Iowa, 350 miles wide. By the time it got here, you know, we're looking at kind of hurricane force winds, which we're not really used to here in D.C. Every now and then we get, get some storms that uh, might have gusts that high, but this was a very, very powerful storm. And we had had some other storms uh, over the last few years, microbursts and things like that, that caused some serious damage, but this one really uh, packed a punch, punch on us. Uh, I know this is kind of the, the, the kind of the end point, but situational awareness for us is key. And in every incident that we have, we always go back and look at you know what was the information that we had that we had prior to the event, if there was any. Uh, how did we share that? Did the right people get the information at the right time? Uh, we have issues uh, with communications infrastructure. This particular storm actually. Uh, uh, one of the cascading uh, impacts of it was the impact to our 911 system. Uh, we, uh, we use a, a carrier that everybody's uh, familiar with. I'm not going to rat them out too bad here, but uh, they, uh, they had a failure of a couple of their, ge couple of their generators. And, and actually, our 911 system in Arlington County was down. Uh, that didn't happen until about 7.30, 7.45 the next morning, Saturday the 30th. Uh, but it had a huge impact on our community. Uh, we activated our emergency uh, operations center. 
That was a full activation for us. A lot of times we'll do things virtually. We'll just have people call in on conference calls, and we'll use a web-based system to kind of communicate and, and collaborate. But for this one, we brought people in. Power restoration. Two-thirds of, uh, of our county was without power, some for up to eight days. Huge. We all, it was hot. It was, it was, you know, summertime. We have a lot of folks who are in uh, various levels of assisted living, everything from uh, private homes all the way up to uh, hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living facilities. And somebody, uh, if you look at Arlington County, a lot of high-rise buildings. So we had a couple of our high-rise structures with some, you know, older folks, uh, infirm folks, uh, where the generators had failed and the power had failed in there. And it was pretty hot on the 10th and 11th floor of some of these buildings. It, it, was, it, was, it was terrible. Uh, some of the other things that we learned from this is, is the need to always have, uh, have a handle on your staffing, particularly the first responders, police and fire. They always step up to the plate. But it really does get down to uh, personal preparedness at every level, not just the county with our capabilities, but down to the individual level, uh, individuals and families and schools and businesses. Just it's so important for, for all of us to be prepared. And then uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of debris gets, uh, gets created when you have these kinds of storms. And when you're in Arlington, you know, where do you put it? You know, where do you gather it? Where do you, where do you aggregate it at? And what are you going to do with it after you can't just dump it somewhere? So... A lot of that. Uh, there was a lot of good things that happened that we learned uh, and we want to capitalize on. First off, our internal and external uh, communications, just amongst each other within the county, but also with the public. You know, with the power <coughs> down and a lot of our, you know, communications mediums, you know, people couldn't turn on their TV. Hopefully they had a battery-operated radio. We actually operated an AM radio station and we're getting ready to uh, actually add an FM capability to that if people have battery operated radios. We were communicating with people by our AM radio, but we also uh, leveraged the community uh, through our community emergency response team to actually go door to door, particularly to the vulnerable populations and to the folks that might be on the other side of the digital divide and actually hand out flyers in English and Spanish to tell them what was going on, what they could do to stay safe, uh, give them as much uh, updated information as we, we could. Again, personal and organizational preparedness are key. And, of course, uh, we say this in our EOC all the time, you know, uh, be happy and be flexible because most of these operations like this go over a period of operational periods. We, we use 12-hour operational periods. We went from uh, 1 o'clock in the morning uh, on the 30th until uh, midnight on July 4th. So we're, our EOC was activated 24-7. And that's, that's kind of a campaign operation for us. Uh, warning, National Weather Service. As I said, we got a, a lot of weather information throughout the day. I think in retrospect, uh, for me as the emergency manager, it would have been nice to know more the ferocity of this particular storm. We knew it was going to be bad, but for me personally, uh, I, it, it didn't really click until about a half hour before this thing hit how, how horrible this was going to be. Uh, I've already dimed out uh, Verizon there on the uh, on the phone system there. Uh, I, I got to give them a lot of credit. They've done a lot of work since uh, we, we, we had this particular incident. There was a number of investigations done, uh, conducted by the FCC, the State Corporation Commission in Virginia. The governor of Virginia actually uh, appointed uh, some elected and appointed and, uh, and staff folks like me uh, to uh, to an investigative body. Uh, to work with Verizon and, uh, and try to keep this from happening again. And this was, this was actually human error. They didn't check their generators. They should have checked their generators. They put the systems in place, and they have communicated much better with us uh, uh, since then. Uh, for us, uh, you know, just intersections. You know, uh, it, it, was, it was huge. If people are driving up and down the streets, and there's no, there's no traffic signal. So our police chief uh, got out there. We used every communication medium. We had we told everybody just treat every intersection like it's a four-way stop sign. Please slow down. Please be careful out there because uh, while we didn't have any fatalities in Arlington, Fairfax County did have a couple of fatalities as a direct result of this storm. One was electrocuted. One was crushed by a falling uh, falling tree. Uh, again, our uh, 911 service was out uh, for four days. So what do you do when you don't have 911 in the community? I mean, we we told the citizens to basically uh, go to the local firehouse. And our fire stations are pretty pretty uh, closely grouped together in an urban community like that. Flag down a police officer. 
Uh, and we were actually left firefighters and police officers in the fire stations to be like the 911 center, and they were uh, using their portable radios to call back to the uh, our ECC, our Emergency Communication Center, to dispatch resources. But then uh, a couple days into it, the, the community emergency response team said, hey, you know, maybe we can take over that task for you. And they did. So we actually used citizens with radios in the fire stations to be the 911 center out in the field. And that worked really, really well. In fact, the Somebody walked into the station down in Crystal City and said, hey, by the way, the Harris Teeter down the street, I think there's a fire. Uh, and we set resources down there and got it out really, really, really quick. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I think I already talked about the generator maintenance, Verizon. Uh, it's so important that systems uh, provide not just redundancy, but that they're checked. And that we have a system, that the system of systems is checked. So, again, Verizon has done uh, a lot of great work. Power restoration, a lot of folks don't understand why their power is not coming back on uh, when the people across the street, when their power is coming on. I mean, that just happens. And, and we got a lot of questions. We actually did a lot of community education on our power grid, how it's set up, and why one area is going to come up maybe before your area comes up. Uh, a lot of people, you know, they, they still don't want to hear it because they see the lights on across the street. Uh, but I think our, our power company, Dominion uh, Power, did uh, yeoman's work because you know when they're, when they're out there restoring this power, their worker safety is 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 is, is of the utmost importance, and they can't start sometimes working on it until some trees are removed. But we're not going to start removing trees around live wire. So there's a lot of coordination that has to occur between the power crews and the public works people that are uh, actually uh, working with the down trees. Vulnerable populations again. Uh, just our human services folks were in all of these facilities, communicating with them constantly throughout the life cycle of this event, uh, making sure that, that, that people were safe, making uh, arrangements if we needed to to evacuate people. A lot of folks were evacuated, the family members, so we worked with, with everybody, with the facilities and the family members uh, to take care of folks. And we didn't lose anybody in any one of these facilities. So uh, we, we did learn a lot of lessons about that. Uh, you know, some of the shelters that we would normally use uh, really weren't available to us. I mean, because they didn't have generators. So uh, we, we've done some things uh, since then to make sure that uh, some of our facilities that didn't have generators now have generators. And we've worked with some of these uh, assisted living facilities to make sure that they have power, power uh, generation redundancy as well. So. Uh, communications with the power companies, uh, excellent at the management level. Uh, one of the things we found out in the field is sometimes the crews uh, didn't communicate as well as they could, and that may have slowed up uh, some of the progress. So we were working with them. We actually institute or reincorporate the folks in the field in our incident <laughs> command system that we use very much like when we're uh, coordinating uh, the activities at, at a fire or a law enforcement event. And uh, we've done, done much better since then. A lot of damage. Uh, again, no, no fatalities, 1.6 mil in uh, private property damage, 872,000 public property damage, uh, and in comparison to the, the snow events of 2009 and 2010, uh, about half. Very hot out there, lots of phone outages, really, really hot. Uh, you know, 60% of our county was without power, uh, some of it for up to eight days. And Dominion Power brought in uh, workers from around the country, and actually Canada, we had all the power back on restored in the county by July the 8th. So a lot of, lot of, great, lot of great work by a lot of people. The, the, the slide right there, those, those two uh, fellows in those yellow desks, those are uh, community volunteers. That's the community emergency response team. We have over 500 uh, trained uh, community members in Arlington County. Uh, that are there for response. They're, they work in the neighborhood, so they're the first ones out there. They're, they're the first of the first responders, if you will. Uh, and they're trained in everything from uh, utility control, how to shut off power, shut off gas, to first aid, to light search and rescue, to firefighting, you name it. Uh, they're actually trained by our fire department and my staff in, in emergency management. And uh, after the direction, we put them in a little bit of a non-traditional role by uh, making them uh, emergency communications dispatchers. So. Uh, we're very, very proud of that. Uh, it really, our community came together. Arlington County has a number, of, has dozens of civic associations, and the folks really do band together. 
and it really is about people helping people. So uh, all of our county facilities are open uh, as cooling centers. If they had power, we opened the doors, we brought water in, just get you know people out of out of out of the heat and and, and just be nice to them. Uh, it was, a, it was a mobilization, basically, uh, of the entire county. Our Parks Department, our Department of Environmental Services crews were out there 24-7, you know, doing everything they could to, to get the debris removed, to get the power back on, and to restore the county back to some sense of normalcy. And, uh, you know, to me, the, the real stars of the show were the human services folks who were working with the vulnerable population and the assisted living facilities, the police department, the fire department. And, and the folks from Public Works who are out there cutting all those trees. So, all told, 416 of our staff worked numerous 24-7 shifts uh, during the recovery, totaling about 40,000 hours. And uh, we used every platform we had, from pieces of paper and flyers, to our AM radio station, to our Arlington Alert system, to uh, news uh, broadcasts and, 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 and news uh, conferences uh, with the local media to get as much information, and, and including town hall meetings, to get information out to the public. Because that's really what it's all about. And in my humble opinion, any large emergency uh, really is going to be driven by the public. The public can make or break our response. And people often say, well, no, it's all about fire police. Well, you know what? They're trained. They've got the equipment. They, 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 they have the training. But if the community doesn't act appropriately, let's say it's a, a dirty bomb and the community decides they're going to run to all the local elementary schools to get the kids out, they can actually inhibit the uh, ingress and egress of public safety assets. So we really need our community to be prepared, to be informed, and we look at them as partners, not as liabilities. So uh, we increased our, uh, our uh, subscription and our Arlington alert. Uh, actually, it's uh, a little bit higher than that now. We are linked in with Twitter and Facebook. We send stuff out. Uh, over every uh, platform uh, that I know of just to get information out to folks. Again, lessons learned, incident command, we use that, it's called the National Incident Management System, we use it every day, uh, not just in Arlington, but throughout this region and throughout this country. Uh, we, did, we do find, because we have a huge turnover, a lot of folks in our, in our community are not prepared, and it's not actually on their radar screen uh, to be prepared, so we're continually working, we're never done with the the uh, preparedness efforts here. So September is uh, Awareness uh, uh, Preparedness Month uh, around the country, and we always uh, have activities that really reinforce that during the month of September, but we, we also do it throughout the year. That's all I've got. I knew that was going to come in. Sorry. And last not least, Mark Moore. providing my own perspectives uh, on the recently concluded Polar Satellite Spectrum Auction uh, in conjunction with a couple of other bands and its impact on our satellite operations. There are key lessons learned from preparing for that auction that most certainly apply to any future auctions. And uh, although we didn't, uh, didn't collaborate, uh, I think I may have answered at least a couple of the AccuWeather questions. <laughs> The first questions you might ask are, why us, or why did they take our spectrum and want more? <laughs> the IEEE published a really good article uh, containing this chart back in October 2010 that answers these questions. 
The answer is actually pretty simple. Both NOAA and the broadband industry want the same band for the same reasons. The arrow shows the approximate location of the frequencies in which most of NOAA's weather satellites transmit data. These frequencies are located right in the middle of the broadband sweet spot, as depicted by the red block at the top of the chart. NOAA's sweet spot is also in the red block. We both want frequencies that aren't bothered by things going on in the atmosphere or inside buildings. We both want transmissions that penetrate buildings. For example, none of you want to miss that important text that's coming in while you're listening to all of us up here on the, on the platform. We both want our signals to travel in a straight line and not follow the curvature of the Earth. We both like this band because broadcasts in these frequencies are not affected by bad weather, especially a heavy rain. Finally, equipment that operates in this band requires small antennas. Imagine trying to use your smartphone if you had to carry a big antenna on your back all the time. <laughs> If weather satellites and commercial broadband providers like to use the same frequencies, what's the tiebreaker to decide who stays and who moves somewhere else? A simplistic view is to follow the money. I've compared the current budget submittals of all U.S. civil space agencies conducting remote sensing and Earth science missions. This includes NOAA, the Landsat portion of USGS. I probably should have included the data collection uh, that would bump you up to about a billion, as Bob mentioned and various NASA Earth science and climate spacecraft. As you can see, the net revenue generated from the recent auction of frequencies in which most of these satellite programs operate was about 10 times the combined budgets of the three agencies operating these satellites and building future ones. If money were the only criterion, we would be shutting off weather satellites right now. Fortunately, that's not the case. We're embarking on a scheme where we share the frequency bands. Spectrum auctions are here to stay. My previous chart demonstrated the value of spectrum to the broadband industry and the enormous amount of money they paid for 65 megahertz of spectrum before building a single tower, signing up a single customer, or hosting a single selfie. <coughs> the demands for bandwidth will continue to be insatiable, not only by the public, but also by other huge economic sectors. Pick up the paper almost any day, sorry, read it on your smart, read the website on your smartphone, and you will most likely find a story about new ways that the medical, transportation, or agricultural sectors plan to consume broadband. The laws of physics and economics say that the available bandwidth can only come from spectrum currently occupied by government users such as NOAA. Commercial broadband providers and equipment manufacturers are much more able to quickly respond to changes in spectrum use or public demands than government agencies. For example, all of your iPhone 6s will be obsolete before the end of this year. Satellite and ground systems generally require about 10 years on average to design and build, have very long lifetimes on orbit, and last many years beyond their design lives. As a result, we are locked into the same designs and product distribution systems for decades. In one of the early spectrum sharing meetings in 2010, I had another government colleague comment to me, what you know of people do with direct downlinks is so 70s. <laughs> Guilty as charged. There is the general expectation that government systems can simply move to a different frequency to give up spectrum. While it may be straightforward for systems exclusively used by the government, such as military or law enforcement agencies, redesigning systems such as NOAA's that connect to the non-federal sector, as we heard today, can result in significant cost and operational impacts. The next two charts illustrate these costs and impacts using a very familiar example from the not-so-distant past. <laughs> How many of you guys remember the digital TV converter boxes and coupons? Yep. I ordered my two. <laughs> How many of you bought converter boxes for your analog television sets? Full disclosure, I bought two of the Insignia ones from Best Buy. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you bought brand new flat screen high definition television sets costing a couple thousand dollars and the new digital home theater systems you had to buy in order to be compatible with your new television? How many of you built these costs into your family budgets? I won't ask how many of you incurred consumer debt in the process. <laughs> Spectrum auctions as we experienced during the digital television conversion cause users, us, 
to either spend money we hadn't budgeted to spend or continue to, re to continue to receive television broadcasts or simply decide that we weren't going to watch television anymore. Present and future auctions of weather satellite spectrum will require significant changes, perhaps costly ones, among our user communities if we are going to continue to provide the timely and accurate weather data our citizens deserve. I'm not quite done with the digital TV story yet. After you bought all those new television and home theater systems, how did you get rid of the obsolete hardware that you got in the As you can see here, somebody came up with a low-cost solution and simply dumped three analog television sets alongside the road of my rural dirt road in western Loudoun County, Virginia. I don't recall anyone offering coupons for a free disposal at a local landfill or holding special disposal days in local communities. Instead, the program was designed such that dumping televisions alongside of the road was an option. Just these three televisions polluted the landscape, still present injury hazards to humans and animals, and they contain toxic chemicals that can leach into the ground. Will we have adverse consequences in the weather satellite sector? We'll shortly find out. As we proceed down the path leading toward sharing of NOAA's polar satellite frequencies, several lessons learned resulted that I think are important to take into the future. Some industry standard analyses used to calculate interference characteristics and ultimately the size of the protection zones were shown to be outdated or sorely in need of revision. It is up to us to demonstrate through testing that these standards do in fact need revising. We were grateful for the participation of many domestic and international individuals and groups in the public comment period for the polar spectrum sharing. We can do better encouraging more parties to respond and actively participate. We found that most regulators and policymakers understood that GOES provides nightly weather images and that rebroadcasts such as MWIN are essential to the success of first responders. But we were less successful explaining a more abstract concept such as the criticality of ingesting polar satellite data into numerical weather models. Ironically, all of this happened before Hurricane Sandy, which demonstrated the value of model accuracy. Thanks to many forecasters and broadcast meteorologists, terms like GFS and the European model are now household words inside the beltway. Regulators and policymakers declared that non-federal users would not be afforded protection. Those users, unfortunately, weren't that organized and vocal enough to effectively push back. I think we eventually did an okay job protecting our critical polar sites, but we need to do a better job defining the role that non-operational science and non-federal users play. Deloitte, in a 2014 study for the broadband industry, examined the complexities involved with sharing a band with government incumbents such as NOAA. This graphic kind of looks like a Myers-Briggs personality profile. <laughs> and actually, it's not all that far off. <laughs> the least complex sharing arrangement, and consequently, what we're using in the polar world is the lower left block near the intersection of the horizontal and vertical axes. Static and continually defined is most closely aligned with the polar spectrum protection zones. Critical sites are fixed in location and transmission characteristics are known. And that's actually fairly straightforward uh, to be able to share those bands, at least with the uh, protection zones. At the completely opposite end of the scale is the situation we will face if the GOES spectrum is ever auctioned. Because M1 and GOES rebroadcast is used by federal, state, and local governments for severe weather and natural disaster events, we cannot establish fixed protection zones because we do not know when, where, and for how long first responders will deploy. They will be highly dynamic in terms of geography and time. And according to the Deloitte study, this type of sharing arrangement is the least desirable for the commercial broadband industry. Does this mean that the regulators and policymakers will leave us alone? Does this mean that the broadband industry will decide that it's too tough and look elsewhere? Will the future administration and Congress direct us to take measures to make this ban more desirable? Time will tell. When the sharing of polar spectrum begins, NOAA's customers most likely to see interference are non-federal users receiving direct readout products from polar satellites. Geography is everything. 
If you're lucky enough to be located inside or very close to a protection zone, you stand a good chance of remaining mostly interference free. If you are located within one of the top 100 broadband markets but outside a protection zone, you have a high likelihood of experiencing interference, especially during periods of heavy broadband use. If you are lucky enough to live outside one of the top 100 markets, your probability of receiving interference is reduced. Where are the top 100 markets, you ask? <laughs> there they are. I'll also point out that nine of the protection zones for the polar systems are located within areas comprising the 100 mm -hmm. broadband, top broadband markets. So there is a lot of incentive for the private sector to make sharing work because they certainly want access to potential customers in these markets. So as we move ahead into the future, perhaps involving those products and services sharing, there are a few emphasis areas I think we can take ahead. First of all, I applaud AMS's willingness to be a visible and influential focal point. Your sphere of influence encompasses the halls of Congress right down to broadcast meteorologists who can bring this issue into every American home. Ironically, AMS can also communicate the message via the very broadband systems who desire access to our spectrum. <laughs> I encourage you to emphasize the full scope of potential impacts to first responders that cannot do their job of protecting and serving their citizens without uninterrupted satellite reception from those and those are. I would also urge you to capture these ideas in non-technical terms that the general public can understand. I encourage you to seek out any and all opportunities to speak and publicly participate in comment periods and in forums like this. I know it's a tedious job to routinely search the Federal Register and regulatory agency websites constantly to discover relevant notices that require comment. And if you find that person, pay them as much as they want. <laughs> With the resources available to AMS, I would consider conducting simulations that could demonstrate impacts of interference to GOES and GOES R satellite broadcasts. I would call this exercise a day without MWIT. This could be modeled like Department of Defense exercises for a day without GPS or a day without SATCOM. It would be interesting to determine if MWIN and other products corrupted by interference would have made a difference in warning about this week's severe weather in the southern U.S. To wrap up, we in the Weather Ready Nation business must ensure that we remain ready and become even more ready. From the satellites, radars, balloons, and stream gauges that provide forecasts and warning data, right down through state and local government first responders, the private sector, and the broadcast meteorologist media. While the temptation to focus on enormous auction revenue numbers is great, we must not forget that we owe our fellow citizens the very best and accurate forecasts and recovery operations possible. As we have seen time and time again, uninterrupted and survivable communication is the backbone of a weather-ready nation. Thanks, and I look forward to the discussion. Opportunity to reduce it. So I'm afraid users that are non federal, that wouldn't be in any kind of a zone that would keep signals away from them, which is the main really way to, to solve the problem, are going to have to come up with a solution where their antennas are located remotely, um, perhaps uh, shield them in some fashion, but it's going to be very difficult because the user awareness not only of how you get your data from an earth station is about the same level of user awareness as 
if I ask everybody in this room, what frequency do your cell phone operate on right now? Because one, you probably do not know, and two, there are software-defined radios, and as some of the spectrum is sold, it could change. Martin? Yeah, yeah I guess I would just add to that that, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we design and launch these satellite systems uh, with about a, a, a ten-year lead time, and uh, if you uh, if you look at the uh, the acquisition and launch schedule on our website for the GOES-R series, um, we uh, launch the last GOES-R and it reaches its end of mission sometime around 2040. And uh, I'll be 86 years old when that happens. Um, the, uh, the satellite guy in me uh, is a big fan of uh, things like relay satellites, of uh, things like uh, things like remote antennas, uh, but that requires a huge investment. Um, and the, uh, the argument that you get is, well, just send the stuff over the internet. Um, and I think it would be a pretty hard job to uh, uh, run primary and redundant internet lines from all of the stream cages around the country, uh, or from uh, rims of volcanoes that we don't know might erupt, um, back to uh, one of the NOAA centers. Uh, so uh, a satellite communication um, is used because it's survivable and because it works and because you don't have to rely on the ground infrastructure. Uh, I'd like to make um, three points. And Could you actually and please identify question. yourself? Uh, I'm Robert Peters. I'm with the Ghost Off program at NASA on the communications. Um, one of my standard examples is uh, that this network wanted to establish uh, terrestrial applications about 10 megahertz away from our telemetry. And if you compare the ratio of their power to the power of the signal we receive as a distance, it's comparing a grain of sand, a diameter of a grain of sand, to a distance roughly halfway to Mars. And this would be 10 megahertz away. Uh, that's no way you can filter out that kind of signal uh, on the ground. Um, and first point, uh, second point, um, Wallet is already receiving interference from L squared from uh, Newport News. And that's about 130, 140 miles away, and we're considering stay out zones of 25 miles. Um, that wasn't encouraging. Uh, and uh, the M1 uses, a lot of M1 uses, the uh, earth station is mounted on the back of a pickup truck, and it'd be hard to see how you could protect that. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, for the uh, UGSC, how would we engage the 850 users? Uh, that would seem to be a good resource we should try um, to engage. For a response? Okay. Sure. Yeah, so, turn back on um, Those users are very well wired into the, the use of the, the gaming stations and they're very active. Um, when things go down, they complain very loudly to us. Um, I, in the past, we have notified them that the, the spectrum uh, sales were occurring. And, and many of them have uh, responded with, with uh, concern to FCC or to perhaps the congressional. Um, I would assume we would do the same in this case, just to point out that it's occurring and uh, seeking their, um, their, their input on the whole process and any specific ideas they might have for us, USGS, uh, as to how we might address uh, the problem with other sorts of technologies or other uh, strategies for communications. I think Bob's answer kind of relates to a valid point, that in many cases, these meteorological or hydrological products are, they themselves, an intermediate step in the process. And that it's the person that will be affected by the floods, or affected by drought, or the aviation user that receives space weather data that needs to reroute their flights. It, there's one more step in this process, and that the information has a benefit to a sector of the economy of which that, that particular sector could be impacted. 
I think it's hard for us to convey to them that, to translate this into how does interference back here in the less understood weather infrastructure affect someone here, but I'm afraid that in many of these cases it appears that it does. You know, I, I think that's even, you said that'll be difficult, it may be impossible to get that across to people because we rationalize a lot of things. Um, it, I, I can rationalize, oh no, I'm not going to get a flood where I live, but I use my cell phone every day and would love to have more data and faster bandwidth. So I think that's going to be tough. Um, education is important, but I suspect it needs to be at a little higher level than the general public if it's going to be effective, although we need to do it at every level. I agree with you there. That does raise the question, how do you get policymakers educated about this issue? Yeah, when I mentioned earlier about um, uh, the responses to the notices of the rulemaking um, for the uh, uh, proposed at the time uh, polar satellite auction, um, somebody uh, in our operations uh, office uh, had the brilliant idea to send a notice out on MWIN. So, <laughs> the, yeah. uh, so, the, uh, so at least the people that used MWIN that, that turned it on uh, would see that. Um, polar users, it was kind of hard to put a post-hypnotic message in a uh, <laughs> satellite image. Um, so, uh, but uh, when I look back on it, um, we, uh, we got on the order of a couple of hundred, I think, uh, comments into the, uh, into the FCC website. Uh, and you compare that with the, uh, I think it was tens of millions of comments they got over the rulemaking on net neutrality. So somebody knows how to get the job done communicating, and we didn't do so well the first time. Take advantage of the fact that I have the mic. Uh, I've got a little bit Secure World. Uh, my question is, can you talk about the level of awareness of users, uh, of other users around the world, um, including customers that are already using your products? Um, I would assume that some of them don't know how dependent they are on, on these data. Yeah. Um, <coughs> what we have done is while loss of certain products could impact perhaps the accuracy or quality of some of what we do, generally the products are transparent and the users are transparent to that. If we were suffering a major, major loss of something, we would notify people that that potentially could impact the quality or accuracy of what they get. But as a general rule, I don't think people, very many people are aware of that. Um, I think someone had mentioned the various models, uh, the European model and how people are now aware of that, but it has taken many, many people, in, in many TV meteorologists and others, years to, before people probably recognize that, and I suspect that as reasonably weather aware people, we probably think a lot more people recognize those than really do. Yeah, I uh, uh, jog my memory. I came across uh, the AMS conference, I think, in about 2011, and uh, just when all of this spectrum stuff was beginning to happen. And I uh, sat in on a presentation uh, uh, from a, uh, a vice president from the Weather Channel, and uh, uh, you can still find the, the at least the audio of the presentation. And uh, uh, she was talking about um, how their um, outreach to the public had changed over the years and what they were doing as a company to get ready for the uh, for the smartphone era. And, and I'm sure you guys at AccuWeather probably had the same conversations. But they, uh, in the private sector, they can do things that we can't do in the government, like uh, keep persistent cookies and know who logs on to your site. And um, uh, I remember her saying that, uh, well, uh, people don't watch the Weather Channel anymore on television. They don't sit down and watch their weather. Uh, so that's why, even back then, they were talking about going to more series. 
Um, and then she said that uh, we now understand that people aren't going to sit at home on their desktop and look at weather.com. They're going to look at their smartphones. So they, they, they had reached that, that understanding four or five years ago. And then she also said that they had collected enough data to know that the average amount of time that uh, people were on their weather app was about a minute and a half. And uh, uh, she said, we're convinced it's uh, uh, people just uh, checking the weather before they head out in the morning and trying to decide whether they need to bring an umbrella. So, uh, so when you get into the, uh, the models and the soundings and all of that stuff, that really good, intense meteorology and science that goes into producing that decision to take an umbrella, yeah, I think that's part of the understanding, too. And I think in a lot of ways we're victims of our own success. Yeah, I, I think we, we found the same thing. Sure, we have a, a number of people, thousands and in some cases millions, who send us tweets and get all our tweets and communicate very actively. Uh, but the vast majority of people just want to know, hey, should I wear a coat to work today? Is my game going to get rained out on Saturday? And am I going to get killed by a tornado tomorrow so I better yeah. find a place to hide? And they want to know how it impacts them. And most people also, unless it has a major impact, it's hard to get them to take action. Um, so I, I, I think what we really need, if we want to have impact, is a, a multi-tiered approach. Um, organizations like the AMS and the AWCIA do have various relationships and sometimes have things like government days where they speak with legislatures and others and explain from our perspective what's needed. Um, there are groups that put together numbers. For example, while the federal government may be able to get however many billions of dollars from auctioning this spectrum, I wonder what kind of study we could put together that would show here is the impact it will have on forecast and warning quality Here's the impact that deterioration will have on public safety, on the economy, on business, on infrastructure. Um, but again, it's also, it's great to say, hey, if I sell this, I get $2.4 billion in cash tomorrow, and maybe that storm will miss everyone anyway. Yeah. <laughs> to get so, back a little bit to your thing, um, international question, um, one example in this band, the Emergency Managers Weather Information Network is often the only source of tsunami warning to many island entities, uh, uh, both states and protectors. And although the <coughs> spectrum issue today in the 1675 to 1695 megahertz is solely a U.S. domestic issue, um, there are many that depend upon direct broadcast as well as MWIM all throughout the Americas. I think it probably goes without saying that although almost all the member nations in the World Meteorological Organization offer forecasts and have satellite images on their pages, I think there's something like about eight countries and or entities that actually fly and operate weather satellites around the world, and all that data is freely shared. And although our infrastructure here, I think, is fairly sophisticated, that may not always be the case in some of the other countries that you may be inquiring about. Yeah, we just add to what Dave said. That um, uh, my experience has been that um, uh, dealing in both uh, the weather satellite world as well as the spectrum world, uh, both domestically and around the world, uh, there's very few times, if at all, where those two communities actually talk to each other. And uh, there's there's great organizations that uh, uh, deal with and work. Uh, weather satellite problems like uh, CGMS, the Coordination Group on Meteorological Satellites. Uh, there are great groups of uh, people, both domestically and internationally, that uh, work satellite spectrum issues for weather satellites and other type of science satellites. Uh, and, uh, and I know uh, the only way that CGMS finds out about spectrum issues is I get to write a paper every year. <laughs> and uh, you'd be surprised how many times that, uh, for example, a weather satellite person from another country or another agency will talk about the spectrum issue and then I'll say, well, uh, here's, your, um, here's your spectrum representative to this international group and I have to pull out name and contact information. And they say, oh yeah, he works right down the hall from
for me <laughs> at the same agency. And um, uh, so, I mean, just just getting the satellite and the spectrum groups together to talk about these common issues, I think, would go a long way. Um, it's, uh, to the point of, uh, of engaging our, our users and and, uh, and trying to get them uh, to be spokesmen for, uh, for protecting uh, or uh, the, the sharing or the impact uh, that uh, frequency sharing might, might have. I was just thinking it, it's somewhat analogous to the uh, aircraft accident that just happened in, in, uh, uh, in France where you know, we could have, that that condition apparently existed for a long time before uh, something happened that uh, dramatized uh, the impact of, of you know uh, not having a, two pilots or two people in the in the cockpit. I it's a, I, I draw the same sort of uh, analogy to to this condition. We could probably operate for some period of time. Uh, under uh, frequency interference, and the public would see really no impact. It's the those rare occasions. That's why the rare occasions that would only happen, uh, you know, uh, if if you had uh, our primary communications break down at the same time you had a critical time dependent event happening uh, that would bring that to light. And so it's really hard to sell that. Richard Rogers from Stellar Solutions. I, I wanted to see if uh, David, uh, if you could expand on the international impact. Are there lessons learned that we can gain from other countries, other regions that have dealt with uh, the spectrum density issues and, and sharing and so on, or especially from the Far East, perhaps, or from Europe? Richard, there are a number of practical factors in each case. It's probably a little bit different. Um, I believe that many people's concept of spectrum sharing and interference mitigation <coughs> may differ depending on whether you're a terrestrial operator and you're trying to keep your signal from interfering maybe with something else that's similar strength that's on an adjacent channel uh, versus a satellite operator that might be thinking, maybe I'm, I'm getting interference to a transponder in space or I'm having problems helping an antenna. So all the specifics are a bit different. I think the other thing that complicates this problem a little bit is the laws of electromagnetics and the propagation prediction capabilities differ greatly. Okay, you can pick different commonly accepted in engineering terms of uh, propagation models and get widely differing answers as to how close a particular strong signal has to be before it's going to cause harm to your receiving system. And a receiving system, of course, is the RF or analog front end, amplifiers and the antenna and those components, and then pretty much everything else behind that these days are digital. And so there's a there's a range at which it functions properly, and there's a correction capability often built into that that can fix problems only up to a point. Um, I don't know that I can contrast it Richard internationally, but I can give you a similar example if you have satellite television and you have an extreme rain event or a serious snowstorm, you know, you're watching the signal and then all of a sudden it starts to pixelate and you see some splotches in it. That's because the digital correction can't keep up with the interference. And pretty soon, boom, it's gone. And you get to look at the screen and it says, I'm sorry, your service doesn't work. I'm afraid in digital systems, it's not so much degrading. It's at what point does it just clean, go away? And I think that's the factor here that we'd like users not to have to discover after the spectrum's been sold, after someone installs and makes the investment in both the spectrum and the infrastructure, he says, wait a minute, it doesn't work. There's a very similar situation that has occurred recently between the electronic news gatherers and uh, the LTE signals in downtown New York City. Uh, was uh, something that they've been working on because uh, one of the electronic news gathering channels is very close to one of the new services and it's causing their receiving antennas in advance, such that after they tried to work together, uh, I believe it was a fairly detailed legal filing in the last few weeks from their law firm, uh, from WNBC and to the FCC to try to resolve the issue. So there's just a lot of aspects of this problem, and there's probably no simple one answer. Actually, does uh, raise a question in my mind, and forget it's fairly simplistic. Does the United States government have a definition of what interference is? <laughs> or 
was it just me there? You're shaking your head yes. Yeah, and uh, uh, Dave will have to help me. It's um, 10, well, they, they define harmful interference. Uh, so it's 10, 10 dB above the noise threshold, is that right? I'm not sure, to the best of my knowledge, yeah. that there's a legal definition of harmful interference. It, yeah, the uh, 10, 10, 10 dB is the uh, is the point at which you can tell somebody to shut down who you think is interfering with you if you can find them. Um, but uh, what uh, catches me about that term is harmful interference. It, it, mean, it doesn't mean no interference. Um, so there, are, there are times when you can get interfered with uh, by someone else. Um, Operating according to their license, and it just happens. And um, I'll I'll cite one example that I sure still haven't figured out. Um, I live about four miles from the Leesburg Airport, and uh, uh, every Saturday morning, about 8:30 or so, if uh, if we're still kind of hanging around uh, and we have WTOP on, um, there's uh, some general aviation pilot that uh, I hear him calling the tower um, <laughs> over WTOP. And that certainly isn't in-band interference. Uh, so there's some sort of harmonic, there's some sort of atmospheric propagation uh, that uh, uh, causes that, that interference. And the, uh, the important thing is, is that I know it happens about 8.30 every morning, so I can plan around it if I'm home at 8.30. I'm Mangesh Sanala from the Embassy of India. I represent Indian Space Research Organization. My question is, uh, I'll come to the question later. Uh, I, uh, we saw that the, unfortunately or fortunately, the center of uh, focus on the frequency for both the broadband users, the other broadband users versus the satellite, uh, weather, weather satellite users coincides. And uh, given the money involved and uh, perhaps uh, more and more applications going to be built on uh, broadband, uh, we don't see uh, in the near future that the center of focus for, for, for the other broadband users uh, shifting from there. So my question is whether uh, we have given a thought of coming with the satellite, whether satellite products which uh, use frequencies other than this frequency, is there a way of uh, us going away from that rather than expecting them not to encroach into our area? Well, I think I had, um, I mentioned about uh, how long it takes to design and build a satellite system. Uh, so if you, uh, if you use the uh, uh, timeline of uh, the last goes R reaches its end of mission at uh, around 2040, uh, that means you need to start designing the son or daughter of goes R uh, sometime in the late 2020s. So uh, in the late 2020s, you need to make a prediction on what the broadband industry is going to look like in 2040. And uh, I mean, I'm not sure I even know what the broadband industry is going to look, look like next week. Uh, and when I made the comment earlier that uh, they, they change a lot more quickly than we do, um, it's, it's, it's basically, I think, a losing battle just to keep up. And since that 2040 is just the deployment, you really need to predict out through 2060. At least, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because we'll be stuck again with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Paul Taylor. I work at Lockheed Martin. And uh, we support the Air Force weather program called Mark 4B that supports not only the Air Force, but also other branches of the military as well. Um, so we have sites not only domestic, that, but also international that support uh, geostationary and polar meteorological satellites. Um, most of those are L-band, a lot of them, you know, the EOS generations are X-band, obviously the polars. But uh, we went through the whole when they were selling off the spectrum for the polars, you know, filling out all the data they required, you know, stressing how it's going to impact us. Um, since that time, you know, magically, all of a sudden, we're seeing an interference at pretty much all of our sites, especially in the L band. And uh, I guess I just wanted to stress, you know, something you touched on with, we're ramping on now.